that, I mean, I have like screenshots of these pages because there's really, I mean, installing these tools is, is really simple. You just need to go download them. I mean, if you've ever installed software, which I think we all have, uh, you can have no problem installing any of, any of this stuff. Um, and this is just kind of my hedge against whether or not the internet was working. Um, but it is working, so uh, we're just going to go straight to CloudScript uh, to looking at some examples. So the first thing I'm going to show you is what you get after you install Lionscape in, um, in Visual Studio. You get this handy menu, which you can use to give them money, which I never use. Um, I've not been able to get it to show me uh, like the new item for CopyScript without um, creating like a web project. So it seems to turn itself on um, when you're in a web project, and then you get the ability to create CopyScript files. Um, what new file, right? Down at the bottom. Uh, yeah. Hey, Patrick, um, so, so it's a plugin for a Visual Studio. Do you know if it's available for Eclipse as well? Or? I don't. I've never looked into it. You know, um, in the slides I have a link to Mindscape, so um, you should be able to figure that out. But I mean, once you leave Windows and you, or you leave Visual Studio, there's lots of IDEs for you know Mac, and there's lots of IDEs uh, that like Cloud9 and stuff like that. You know, so. Um, it shouldn't be too hard to find support in Eclipse. I would be surprised if they didn't have it. And I'm also surprised that it's not showing me what I thought it was going to be. Let's try it this way. Okay, there they are. So these are the three things, the three new templates that you get after installing the web workbench. Right? Uh, there's, like I said, I don't. Never even look at SAS or less. Um, <coughs> I understand they're like, you know, the next best way to do CSS. Um, but you also get to build the CopyScript template. And so you can create uh, your new CopyScript template, uh, new CopyScript file. And uh, it's going to be down here in your scripts directory if you happen to have like an NBC website. And you can start writing CopyScript. So here we go. Hello world. save on this file, it compiles and creates the JavaScript, which appears down here as a dependent item. So that's the output, that's the JavaScript that that Hello World gener generated. And so if you were writing something that you're actually going to use on your website, you would refer to the JS file, right? The CopyScript file is like where you work, but the JS file is what your website needs. So, how do I run this? Like, I mean, if, if you guys have ever, like, been working in this mode, like, you know, maybe you think, well, I want to, like, create, like, an HTML page, and then I want to reference this script, and then maybe I can run it and see what's going on. But, I mean, I, didn't, I don't find that very satisfying. And when I was trying to learn CopyScript, I wasn't, my goal wasn't to make a uh, website. So, I mean, the idea of creating, like, a web page to run it for me just, just didn't seem right. So, um... After, after that, I would jump on over to uh, CopyScript.org, and I'll explain this syntax in a second. Um, we'll spend some time on CopyScript. So, when you go to CopyScript.org, you have pretty extensive documentation, right? All linked right, right on the front page. Uh, the table of contents will jump you to whatever you're interested in. Splats are one of my favorites. Um, so, but you can also skip all that and just start trying to play around with it by clicking Try CopyScript. And now you've got the ability to write JavaScript, uh, write CopyScript, and immediately see the CopyScript or the JavaScript. <coughs> just assume that, like, you know, I'm just going to say whatever word I feel like, JavaScript or CopyScript, and you guys will figure out what I mean. Um, so, but if 
if it ever gets confusing, just feel free to shout out. So, like I said, what we get on Kotska.org is we can we can alert things, and you know that's okay when you're just playing. But like, if you're gonna have like you want like ten lines of output, then you're gonna have to say okay, okay, okay. Um, that's when we'll start getting sick of Kotska.org. But you can um, do whatever you want. I mean, it's it's the entire CopyScript compiler implemented as a REPL right here. So like. Um, I'll show you splats, like, you know, in visual, in C sharp or something, we can do something like this. And, and that is equivalent to a CopyScript splat. And so in CopyScript, we would do uh, something on this line. So it's like JavaScript, it's a functional language, so I'm creating a variable and I'm assign a function to it. skinny arrow is the lambda syntax, so instead of typing like function and then your variable and then having curly braces and everything, you just put your two braces and, uh, and an arrow and you can start writing your function. If it's a one-liner, like this top one up here, the hello world one, then you can just leave it there. But if you, you know, want to start writing like a real body where you're going to be doing stuff here and here, uh, it's, it, um, it's scoped based on indentation, right? So you don't need the, um, any kind of curly braces or anything like that. And, you know, whenever the indentation level matches, you're going to be in the same scope, right? You can see on the JavaScript side that it's moving the curly brace to capture those things. you also notice on the um, JavaScript side that it's returning that, that string at the bottom. Um, of course, that's not going to work if I hit run, but it, everything is an expression by default if you can make it an expression, meaning every every function you write is going to return something unless you explicitly say something like um, return undefined. So if you really, really want to have a void, you can, but otherwise just whatever's last is going to be returned. The last expression. Yeah. Well, the last expression will be returned. You can return earlier, right? right? So. You know, if you're in a loop and you find the thing that you want in the loop, you can return from the loop with that. But if you're in a loop and you're just processing that loop, so if we have 40 each x and something, right, and we're doing something with x, right, and you don't have this return on the find at the bottom, then we get, um, and then we'll get, like, it'll build, like, an, an array and it'll start putting the results of each expression from inside the loop into the array and then return the array. Hmm. So that can be annoying if you don't care about the array. So that's when I would usually go and, and do like the return undefined thing at the bottom to get rid of all the extra JavaScript that it generates for something that I don't, um, don't care about. And I, a lot of times you can just do whatever you feel is the logical thing to do. And it'll work in CopyScript. So if you're coming from Ruby, this might look more familiar to you. Um, and if, but if you're coming from C Sharp, like I was, um, you might just like, without even thinking about it, um, define uh, some function that does something, and then just put your curly brace and start going. And that works too. Well, it used to work. I think they actually took it out in a recent <laughs> update. Um, if you want, I mean, it's, it's all just programming, right? If x equals 1, then do something. Um, so I've got some of this stuff. I've got a syntax error somewhere. There we go. So, you know, you can see it translates the double equal into the triple equal. Again, like, this is the whole idea of getting rid of, like, the confusing parts of JavaScript. So everybody else just thinks, oh, I'll do double equal. Um, so it, so CopyScript says fine, double equal, and we'll give you the triple equal because that's what you actually wanted. Can I ask real quick, if you said if message, would that give you a true key value for Because you, you, you want to check basically that function is defined. Yeah. So you, I was curious what it does. Well, that, yeah. Okay, so it does. Yeah. And we'll run it. So there's our first one. 
So, yeah, I mean, again, if you think that's what it should do, try it, and most likely it will do what you expect it to do. And you can, and it has a lot of nice, like, convenient alternate syntax, like, again, if you're coming from different languages besides JavaScript, right, if you want to say, um, if x is defined, do something, then it'll, uh, that'll translate into equals equal. So you can do is, you can do isn't, you can write and, or you can use double apostrophe, uh, double ampersands, you know, you can do it either way. <coughs> mix and match. Um, like, like I said, you just um, do what you think will work and it probably will. So this can be fun for a while, right? Um, but let's look at something that's not trivial and, and, and then I'll just stop, you know, pounding on the keyboard and putting random strings in there. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you guys real quick about finite state machines. They're a really simple model of computation, and you can think of them as like uh, a primordial version of a regular expression. And in fact, the term regular expression comes from finite state machines. But in the real world, when you know languages like Perl and JavaScript and it started implementing regular expressions, they weren't powerful enough to do what you would actually want to do when doing real work. So they added a bunch of stuff. And so now it's kind of like, you know, back in the day, a computer was someone who sat at a desk, and now it's a machine. So back in the day, a regular expression was a very primitive thing, and now it's much more powerful. But So we're not going to look at it as a regular expression. We're going to look at this diagram, right? And this diagram describes what the machine does, right? The first arrow points at where the machine starts. So that's state Q0. And then you have the arrows leading out of each node, which describe ways to leave that node. And so what you imagine is that there's an input string, and it's reading the string one at a time, and then it checks its state, and it looks for a path out of its node that matches the input string that it just read. So if it's in state Q0 and it reads a 0, it can move to state Q1, right? And if it's in state Q1 and it reads another 0, it can go back to Q0. This down here means everything, like every every character possible, right? And so I'm saying everything minus 0 or 1. So if it reads anything that's not a 0 or 1, it goes to Q2. And once it's in Q2, if it reads any, this is the bottom thing, it's actually wrong, it should just be anything. If it reads anything in Q2, it just loops back and stays in Q2. The reason that Q0 is double circle is because that's the final state, right? That's the acceptance state. It means that your regular expression matched. The string that was input is a machine that this, it is the string that this stri that this machine is designed to recognize. Okay. So meaning you can read zeros and ones all day long and bounce back and forth Q0 and Q1. If you have anything that's not a zero one, you get stuck in Q2, which is not an acceptance state, meaning it's automatic fail. And you have to end up back in Q0 in order to have the machine be accepted. Look at that guy, he's falling asleep. Um, <laughs> Sorry too much. <laughs> so, based on what I've said, can anyone guess what this machine does? Right? What's the string that it accepts? Only zeros and ones. Binary? Yeah, they have to be zeros and ones, but what characteristic of them? Um, the even number. Right. If the string is not even length, this machine doesn't accept it. Okay? So, you know, I've, I've done this for practice a couple times. Um, the reason why I was using uh, finite state machines with CogScript is because I wanted to learn CogScript, and I've been taking a formal languages class last semester, and I learned about these things, and I was doing them for homework in C++, which was a real pain. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, I wonder how easy it would be or what it would look like if I did something like this in CogScript. And it was a lot easier. And so I had already had that practice. I already knew how to implement it like algorithmically, right? So I, I just needed to translate that to CopyScript. So I know like how I do it, right? I mean, if you guys see what I'm doing and you think that you have suggestions or comments, you want to do it differently, just shout out and uh, you can play with it and see how it works out. So we have our, we have like nodes, we have paths leading out of the nodes, and, uh, you know, we need to know like, which one's the final state, right? And we need some way to read a string, right, one character at a time. So what 
I usually do is I start by defining each of, I, I, I've kind of always focused on the, the paths, right? Just defining the paths out, you know, and that should be enough for me to figure out, you know, what state I'm in and whether or not I can go somewhere else. So we'll define like a constructor function, function that creates a description of that path, right? Which I'll just call rules from now on. And we're going to need to know three things about that path, right? We need to know what's our current state, what is uh, the input character, and what would be the next state that we would go to that matches. So there's our, our basic function, and we're going to want to return an object. So if we wanted to build up a um, op, like what would be equivalent to like a JSON object, we would uh, we would just start writing. If we wanted to find a property, we would say like state colon, and then we can assign it right here. So you can see what's happening on the JavaScript side, right? Um, it is return. It's it's now returning an object, right, that has a property on it, a state. Can you make this font bigger? I don't think I can do that here, but that gives me a perfect excuse to jump over to Sublime. So, I think I can do that here. We won't have the live stuff right away, but I can show you Node.js. Okay. So, all right, let's assign the rest of our properties. Uh, let's see, say character. This is what I like about um, Sublime. Their approach to doing auto-completion is brilliant. It doesn't try and parse what you're doing or think about the language. If you've written it before, it offers you as, as an auto-complete. <laughs> so, let's see, we'll just call that next. All right. So, we've, we've written this, and uh, do you guys want me to keep sharing the JavaScript or, or any time you guys want me to jump over and show you the JavaScript? It's pretty helpful to see that JavaScript yeah. live. Yeah, so... Try to do the control and plus on the... I doubt it. Oh. Uh, look well, at that. It's getting bigger and smaller. Does <laughs> <laughs> right. right. this work? Right. <coughs> see, I told you guys, I don't you know anything. Alright, so here's our little object. It's just a property bag right now, right? Uh, the other useful thing that it could do for us would be to um, tell us whether or not there's a match, right? So that when we, when we get to building that machine, it can just query this rule and say, do you match my current state and my input character? So we'll just define a function. This is basically the same. Again, it's just a property. It's just JavaScript. It's just a, a data value, right? But we're going to assign a um, function to it this time instead. So C will be our current character and our current state, meaning the current state of the machine. And we'll just have I be the input character. And now we're just going to define a function and we're going to say, uh, again, the last thing that I write in the function will be returned by default. So I can just say, State is machine state, and care is input care, or care is I. And over here, I'm going to go out a little for a minute. Is that still good? Is that still visible? Okay. So, and then we get our function defined for match, right? And it's automatically returned. And I use the English language versions. You could just as easily use um, equals equals, or you could 
say, you know, is it not, I mean, you can do all the stuff in you. Anything that you can possibly think of, you can kind of do. So it translated to triple equals, and translated to double ampersand. And, uh, I mean, again, it's just going to do kind of what you expect it to do. So now that we've defined our create rule function, I mean, you could say, you know, like my rule equals create rule. And you don't need parentheses, right? I often, I often type them because um, that's just my habit, being a C-sharp programmer. But the only time you need them is if the function doesn't take any, any um, parameters, right? Because it needs to disambiguate between whether or not you're just trying to pass around that function like we did to check to see if it's defined, or whether or not you're trying to actually invoke it. But since this guy takes parameters, we can just give it some values, right? And, uh, and that'll create it for us. So there it is invoking the create rule constructor function to create our object. And then we can, you know, like we can ask it whether or not it matches certain values. And we can give it, like, an invalid state or that it's not set up for. And this should be false. Right? Because it doesn't match. Just a question real quick on um, where you use the uh, at sign for state. Is that to imply closure? And and if so, why? Because uh, no, it doesn't uh, it does not imply closure, I think, if I understand what you're meaning. Or it might. It's equivalent to doing this. So it's just shorthand for writing this dot. Um, the arrow does affect the way, again, I do not know about JavaScript enough to like really give a good explanation of this, but you're going to want to look into the difference between this arrow and the skinny arrow. They call it the fat arrow and the skinny arrow. The fat arrow, <coughs> when, you're, when you're using an uh, actual class in JavaScript, using that class keyword that they added, you want to generally use the fat arrow because it uses like proto attaching prototypes or whatever that stuff is. And I know nothing, right? Um, and you need to bind this correctly, right? And the fat arrow generally, when you're when you're doing that type of prototypical inheritance, does the correct binding of this. And skinny arrow doesn't always. Um, but I generally a shallow copy of it, or was it deep copy? I have no idea. I have <laughs> I think it's only referring to, I can see from the JavaScript, it's only referring to the scope that it's actually going to return you. So at state, is, or with the skinny arrow, is just giving you what you're returning inside that function. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you use the fat arrow, it's going to give you everything outside of that. So if you declare some private variables mm -hmm. um, above your return there, you would have access to it inside your match function. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times when I was like doing more advanced machines, like you know, I was getting to like the Turing machine, I was trying to play with the class and stuff like that. Uh, I was getting like, well, that's not defined, that's not defined, right? And then Fat Arrow fix that for me. Right. Um, there's lots of great resources online about people who know a lot more about JavaScript and JavaScript than I do. So, this is truly a crash course. I am here, it's like an old war movie where, you know, you're, you are you come up to me and I say, here's a gun kid, go to the front. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now uh, where we can make rules, right? And so we need uh, a way to process those rules. So we'll define our machine. And I'll go ahead and define it as a class, just so we can see that. Uh, you know what? And I'm even going to head out here just to check the syntax. Yeah, OK. That's what I thought. So when you define a class, and we'll see on the JavaScript side, it'll make a lot of sense to you guys, but not so much to me, uh, <laughs> that we, there's a special, keyword, a special keyword called constructor, right? And we can start assigning, you know, the, you know, whatever we want. Um, oh, we need parentheses, probably. And if I were to use these things somewhere, you can see that it's saying class.apply this arguments, right? Um, and classes equal to machine and all this, and then later I can say, uh, you know, b equals new machine, and pass it some parameters. And then, I don't know, maybe I should actually try and do something that works. So let's 
let's just go ahead and see how this works out with our class. If it's not going to work, then I'll just go back to doing the constructor function. Um, so, our machine. What is our machine do now? It needs to know its initial state, right? Because that arrow points at Q0. It needs to know a set of rules. And it needs to know what's acceptable, which of our state is the acceptance state. You can have more than one acceptance state in a finite state machine, but our example only has one. So, but I'll declare it as an array to acknowledge the reality. So, I said it reads uh, it reads characters one at a time. So, I'll create a function called read, and it'll take a character. And it should appear once I start doing stuff. Uh, and we'll say like for each rule in uh, rules. Now I didn't do anything with rules, right? When you're defining a class and you just use the at name right there. It just automatically is supposed to create the, the correct um, like instance or static variable. I'm not sure about the correct terminology there. And um, so, and and then you can use. So they don't use it here. They just say you know, over here on the JavaScript side, it creates a thing called this dot name and it assigns a name to it, right? And here on the JavaScript side, all you did was declare name in the in the arguments of the of the, of the lambda, and you, you can see over here that you know it's applying these functions to the prototype. You can inherit them and all that stuff. But you know what? I just I don't see it working over here. Like on our JavaScript side, we're just not getting all the stuff that we see in the example, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that, <coughs> and I'm just gonna go ahead and make another constructor function. So uh, what did I say? It needs an initial state. It needs um, a set of rules. It needs final states. Another thing that we can look at over here on the um, on the JavaScript side is that every time I'm, I'm creating things over here, it's adding it to the top level, right? It's declaring all that stuff up there using the bar keyword. You can't use the bar keyword on the JavaScript side because it's just, you have to use it, so it always puts it there for you. Um, what we don't see in the in the REPL that we see over on, in the actual copy script is that, just to remind you guys what's going on, is that, so that var message is not showing it to us on copyscript.org, right? The line above it is not there. And so it is doing the thing where it's enclosing all that stuff in its own function. So you do have scope, right? It's not global, right? So everything that you do in your copy script is going to be contained in its own uh, namespace. You don't have to think about it at all. I like not thinking about it at all. Um, so in our constructor function, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to assign these things. So say like current state is the initial state. And I just make them capital because I like to. I mean, you don't have to. And I'm going to read a character. And I'm going to scroll down. So, again, I don't, again, I can't really tell you why the class thing wasn't working, but it does work. <laughs> so, um, and I wanted to iterate over these rules. Um, 
the more I think about implementing these machines, the more I think that this, this loop right here is not really, there could be a better way to do it, like a better way to look this stuff up. Um, but, you know, it's like almost automatic right now for me to just iterate over the rules. So for each rule, I need the end keyword. And you guys might be interested in seeing um, what that does, but I'm going to say if rule.match, and my match one was I took the current state, so at current state. this thing that the index is this underscore underscore index of call and then it rule set rule and then really equals zero. So what it is doing right there is it is um, you know index of is not supported on every browser. So it is it is creating one for you that will work everywhere. Um, and so that does that up here is copy this out so that we can So, you know, up here it's defining underscore underscore index of as if this browser has an index of, just use it, or here's all the dirty mess that you have to do to do an index of without it, right? So again, all of that is a result of having to do, of having um, this end keyword right here, right? So it sensed that I needed that and then it starts working on it. for a finite state machine, uh, but what it'll do is just set the current state. And I'm not working yet. That's cheap. So this is the actual one that I did uh, first time around. No, each. Each is the wrong part. It should just be for rule and we'll set. There we go. Now we got all kinds of stuff going on over here in the JavaScript side. It's, it's defining a bunch of like local variables, all these underscore this, underscore that. And it's doing, again, a really, like to me, looks really ugly and complicated, but I'm sure it is the correct <coughs> way, right? So that's what, what you get when you do for, you know, loop variable in collection, you get this for i equals zero, length equals reference length, i less than length, i plus plus, and ref is set to the actual collection. I'm sure that there's a really good reason for that. I'm sure that Douglas Crocker can explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a um, So, but after, it, but it works, right? So if we, you know, if we match our rule, then we want to update our current state. And r is our rule, so we'll just say r next state. That's very simple. Uh, the la there's a couple more things we need to do before we can actually build a machine and run it. We want to uh, be able to ask the machine if it accepted the input. And that doesn't take any, uh, any arguments. And again, we can just kind of take advantage of our um, implicit return and just say, uh, is at current state in acceptance? And that does a lot of stuff too, right? And that, that's where it's actually taking advantage of that index of operator that it defined in a way that's useful to us. 
So when I did four rule and rule set, it sees that I want to iterate over it. When I just say variable in collection, it interprets it as boolean, right? And it does this index up thing to determine whether or not that thing is in the collection. Um, you know, performance-wise, that could like be something that you might want to keep in mind because you know that index up thing has another loop in it. So I mean, if we have big collections, we're going to you know go to n times n times n type of uh, situation. We use it a lot. Uh, the last thing I like to do on when creating this machine is just do like a read all. And what I do with read all is I take advantage of CopyScript's list comprehension feature. So I start off like for rule up. Uh, and actually, what you start off doing is you tell it what you want it to do. So I want it to read. You give it just like a local variable read x, and then you say for uh, x in, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this, and that should give me an array of characters. So what does read all look like? Yeah, so it calls split on the string, right, because I'm going to pass in a string to read all. Signs up to ref, it creates a new array starts iterating over the ref array, and then it's going to call read x on each one of those um, characters that it pulls off the string. And this is what I was talking about. It, it created this result array, and it's pushing the results of each call to read into it. And then at the bottom, it's implicitly returning the results, right? So it's doing all that work because it wants to return something all the time, right? Which is fine in a lot of cases, but in, in my case, read and read all should really be like voids if I was implementing them in a, in a language like C++ or C Sharp, right? Um, they don't need to return anything. And, okay, sometimes it doesn't matter because the thing it returns is so trivial, it's just like value. But, you know, maybe I don't want it to create this extra array and do all that stuff, right? So I can, again, just take advantage of saying return undefined. And you see that on this line, it's no longer pushing that stuff into a result array. It's just calling it, and then the value just going away. Um, and that's maybe might be especially useful here because, you know, what if I had done this? It wouldn't be returning anything useful anyway. Right? If I also returned undefined and read. Um, you, I mean, you can make this a little bit more readable by having a couple of spaces here and there. Um, so. That should be enough. That that machine should work. It should execute our diagram for it for us, given that we have enough the right set of rules, right? And so I think that when I was practicing, I was able to kind of like get this down to like four rules. So I'll just declare an array. And what I like to do in CopyScript is put my brackets like this, like one on one line, one on the other, because if you put each item of the array on its own line, you don't have to have like a comma between it. So I can say create rule. And if we remember our diagram, you know, if we're in state zero, we can read a zero or a one and go to state state one, right? So if we're in state zero, we read the character zero, not the number zero. We can go to state one. And then the next rule is if we're in state zero, and we read the character one, we can go to one. So that's that first path out of that node. And it's just the same thing if we're in state one. Uh, we read a zero, we go to back to state zero. And we're in a one, and we read a one, we can go back to state zero. Now we had all those rules that said everything minus zero or one, go to state two, and loop back to state two. When we are implementing a state machine, we don't really want to literally implement every bit of it, right? Especially when, so, you know, if you're in class like I was, teacher always says, simulate a state machine, right? So that gives us a little bit of wiggle room to not have to write a rule for every single character on the keyboard, right? And what we can do is just um, have a little check here. There's a reason why I was returning out of this uh, loop, right? Because if I don't match any rule in my rule set, I'm just going to say 
that if I get to this line, that my current state is going to be 2. And then up here I'm going to say if my current state is 2, Fix thing, it might be a little bit cleaner. So you can have your conditional come after the thing that you want to do. So that that implements all those other arrows that I would have had to implement that all go into state two and move back to state two, right? So if it's uh, if we're already there, we'll just, we're going to have to stay there. And if we don't match any of our rules, then we're going to go there. You know? <laughs> You're missing the end on your return. Which one? Uh, right under read C, return, ah, if. Okay. Can we see the JavaScript in the array? <coughs> uh, the array down here? Yeah. So it's oh, okay. it just completely normal. It goes ahead and puts all those parentheses and semicolons and commas for you. So typically what you would write by hand. So I've got this array of rules and I need to actually now use my function to create my machine. And what it wanted to know was what's its current state, what's the rule set, and what states are acceptance states. So there we go. And now we can Fine, because do you know why? Let's see. Let's go up here to where I called it. I call it here. Can you, can you really add me? Yep. There might be a couple more of those in there. There's one. It gave me the function, right? Because. It doesn't take any parameters, so I need to do that. I wish that there weren't those little things like that. Like, the whole point of it is that you should be able to, you know, like, you know, the whole problem for me with JavaScript is I have to remember so many things. Do this, not that. So the, these little ex exceptions to the rules kind of bug me. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not here saying JavaScript is the perfect language. Um, and it didn't accept it, and it should have. But... Um, for me anyways, it, it was a lot of fun because, like I said, a lot of things that I just tried just worked, right? And it didn't have, it, a lot of the mental overhead um, uh, went away. Anyways, I think we've gone a couple minutes over. Um, but if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I mean, it didn't work, but that's probably that's just me. <laughs> so, I mean, it didn't give us the right answer, but that's not Congress Group. straight to that, that's 2968512 on GIST. Uh, some other resources, I'm going to post the slides on the speaker deck. Uh, again, I wrote, as I was learning CogniScript, I wrote blog entries about each machine that I implemented, so um, after you go to speaker deck and get this, you can, you can get that. CogniScript.org is your best resource, right? And you can contact me on Twitter or email, although by now you should know that I don't know anything that I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> and if you do want to
to see me talk about something that I know about, you can come see me at ASPConf next month where I'll be talking about testing MPCBs. Thanks for coming.